Hello, my name is Michael Tesaro, and I prepared this short case note on the recent case of the ACCC and NASDA Australia. A bit of background about myself. I'm a competition and consumer lawyer. I run my own practice, Tesaro Legal Consulting, which I've been running for about 13 years. Prior to that, I worked at the ACCC. My most recent role was as a director of enforcement. So in both those roles, I was heavily involved in a lot of competition and consumer law cases. And at ACCC, I ran a large number of investigations and litigation on consumer law matters, including misleading and deceptive cases. To outline the presentation, I thought I'd start out with a background to the case and explain what the ACCC alleged that Mazda had done, then briefly deal with the key legislation, then outline the decision made by the judge in the case, and then explore some of the implications of the case, both for consumers and car manufacturers. Now, the background to the case is the ACCC took action against Mazda, alleging that in the period between 2015 to 2019, they had engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct and unconscionable conduct in relation to nine specific witnesses. And these witnesses were seen as representative of a broader problem. The first thing they alleged was a breach of Section 18, which is a misleading and deceptive conduct provision, and also breaches of Section 291 m which is uh, misrepresentations about the existence of rights and remedies. So effectively, the case was that the ACCC alleged that Mazda had misrepresented to its customers their consumer guarantee rights, and also that the treatment that the customers had received in relation to their claims had been unconscionable. So the relevant legislation really is to Section 260 of the Australian Consumer Law. Obviously, the provisions which the ACCC took action under were Section 18, 29, 1M and 21 of the Australian Consumer Law. But what they were effectively arguing in those uh, contraventions was that Mazda had failed to represent the consumer guarantees to its consumers in an accurate manner. So Section 260 sets out when a product will have a major failure. And as you can see, there's five main grounds where a product failure will be considered to be a major failure. The first is a very broad criteria, which is effectively the consumer wouldn't have bought the product had they known about the problems. So that's very broad. So every consumer who buys a car would not have bought that car if they'd realized at that time that the car was going to break down and the engine needed to be replaced. So as you can see, that gives consumers a lot of latitude to claim as a major failure and demand a refund or replacement product. Also, if the goods depart in significant respects from a description sample or demonstration model, now the key here is obviously when you buy a car, you tend to take a demo uh, model for a test drive. And so to the extent that the demo model performed properly and the car you bought broke down, there's an argument that it departed in a significant respect from the performance of the demonstration model. Also, C is that the goods were substantially unfit for the commonly accepted reasons for using the good. So obviously a commonly accepted use of a motor vehicle is to drive to work or the kids to school or whatever. So if the product is unfit for that purpose, it will be considered to be a major failure. So again, if a car breaks down regularly after you buy it, you would say it's substantially unfit for that common purpose that it's supplied for. Also, if there's a disclosed purpose to the supplier or an agent and the product doesn't meet that disclosed purpose, then that would be a major failure. The classic example in the motor vehicle area is where a person explains to the supplier that they need the car for towing, say, a caravan or a boat, and it's unable to do that. And finally, where a good is unsafe. So if a good's unsafe, it's automatically considered to be not of acceptable quality, and that constitutes a major failure. So what the ACCC alleged is that Mazda told its consumers that certain faults with their vehicles were not major failures, 
It also told customers that they were not entitled to a refund or replacement at no cost. Rather, they'd have to make some contribution to rectifying the defect with the car. The consumers did not have an ability to seek a refund or replacement, but rather that Mazda had a right to repair the vehicle, not once, but numerous times. That also that Mazda was not required to provide a refund or replacement given the age or mileage which the vehicle had done. So cars which are very old, a few years old or even um, less, or had racked up a significant number of kilometres, did not have to be refunded or replaced. And finally, that a major failure only arose where there was a failure of a major component in the vehicle. So these are the representations that ACCC has alleged that Mazda made. The key issue here is the ACCC sort of abandoned an initial proposal to prove that these problems with the cars were major failures. And that would have required some technical evidence. Actually, two expert statements were filed in the case. But the ACCC moved away from that case of proving there were major failures to focusing on the representations made by employees of Mazda about consumer guarantee rights. Now, there's also an unconscionable conduct case. And the key thing to realise, ACCC did not allege a system or pattern case. It focused on nine individual consumers who put on affidavit evidence. And there were some common features which the ACCC drew from those nine consumer examples. The first one was that they claim Mazda did not give proper or genuine consideration to the concerns being raised by the consumers. Further, that Mazda had failed to comply with its own internal policies and procedures, which dictated what should happen when a consumer made a claim uh, of a breach of the consumer guarantee provisions. Also, there were allegations that Mazda, who had consumer advocates or customer advocates, had made false and misleading statements to consumers, not simply about their ACL rights and their consumer guarantee rights, but also about things like the fact that the case had been referred to senior management or to the legal area when that had not occurred. They also alleged that the Mazda staff did not give any proper consideration to the safety concerns raised by consumers, as is required by law to allege unconscionable conduct. The company who's engaged in conduct needs to have a dominant bargaining position. So ACCC argued that Mazda had such a dominant bargaining position compared to the consumers. And finally, that the long drawn out discussions over many months and in some cases over a number of years, frustrated the consumers and stopped them from recovering um, a refund or replacement vehicle. So ACCC said all these factors combine to create an unconscionable course of conduct by Mazda towards these nine consumers. Now, a relevant factor here is that Mazda did have some internal policies dealing with the consumer guarantee laws and as you can see they're spot on as far as the law is concerned they say what may constitute a major failure clearly they're saying that problems with a vehicle that make it undrivable or are not quickly or easily repaired which seems consistent with the law also a safety concern would be a major failure expensive to repair i think a key observation here is the next point that replacement of a major component would constitute a major failure, and there they identify a change of engine, transmission, or differential. So the ACCC called nine consumer witnesses who had a range of problems with their vehicles, and there's a summary of them. And as you can see, the first consumer had problems with engine lights coming on, but also the car going into limp mode. Now, what limp mode is, is when the car engine fails, there's a device which allows the car to still be drivable at a very slow speed so that the person can get out of a dangerous position and drive to a place of safety where they can call for assistance. So this limp mode would say occur often on freeways, motorways where you know, consumers are traveling 110 kilometers an hour and suddenly they lose all their power, go into limp mode and 
have to try and get off the freeway. And as you can imagine, that was a very dangerous scenario to be in. There were also problems with the vehicle's adaptive headlights, which meant it was difficult to drive at night. There was a vehicle that had three engine failures and the starter motor failure. There was another vehicle that had three new engines installed over four years. Then the turbocharger went, then the camshaft went, and then it went into limp mode regularly. There was um, engine failures in the next car with the starter motor packing up. There was another case where an engine replacement occurred within five years, followed by stalling. Cars losing power while driving, which is a limp mode again. And the last one was a car going rough idle shortly after purchase and then limp mode. I think that was in relation to a caravan that was being driven on the freeway and uh, it went to limp mode. So the decision of the judge in relation to misrepresentation case was that the ACCC had succeeded in making out virtually every claim that it had put in, in the statement of claim. Effectively, the ACCC decided that Mazda employees had misrepresented the way the law worked in relation to consumer guarantees, that um, the customers had a right to receive a refund and replacement, that they uh, did not uh, have a limitation on their rights to having the vehicle repaired multiple times. So the judge concluded that the, all the misrepresentations or the vast majority of them, which Mazda staff made to the consumers were misleading and deceptive. He also noted that Mazda failed to follow its internal policies, which set out the law quite clearly. There was very little reference by any staff members at any level in the organisation back to these internal policies that Mazda had carefully written out. Effectively, Mazda was representing to its consumers they did not have a right to refund or replacement, but rather Mazda had a right to repair all vehicles uh, and, and they could exercise that right multiple times. So a fairly comprehensive victory for the ACCC on the misrepresentation case. However, on the unconscionable conduct case, the judge ruled against the ACCC and he concluded that it was an unconscionable conduct. Rather, he described Mazda's conduct as appalling customer service. And there's a quote there from the case, and I think relevantly it says that he believed that the conduct of Mazda to the consumers was not sufficiently divergent from community standards of acceptable business practices to constitute unconscionable conduct. Now, it's a funny ruling to arrive at. There's not a lot of reasoning around how he came to that conclusion. And I, and I think that um, on this point, the judge may have got it wrong because I think most consumers would believe that a car, brand new car that you paid you know, full price for, that breaks down shortly after purchase, that needs three engine replacements, and the supplier's refusing you the right to get a refund or a replacement, would not be an acceptable business practice. I think it is sufficiently divergent from the community standards of acceptable business practices for such conduct to be considered to be unconscionable. So I think on this point, the judge may have got it wrong and it'll be really interesting to see if the ACCC decides to appeal that finding in, um, in the full federal court. Now the implications of the case are interesting. The findings from the case that statements made by car manufacturers and dealers to consumers about what constitutes a uh, major failure and when they have a right to a refund or a, a replacement, those findings are going to be very significant because there are a lot of car manufacturing dealers telling consumers that uh, engines that are breaking down that have to be replaced, that significant problems with their vehicles which require multiple repairs are not major failures, there's no right of a refund. So a lot of companies are going to have to really review the way they're dealing with these complaints. The other thing that's really important here is the way the consumer tribunals around the country are just flooded with claims by consumers against car manufacturers for identical conduct that you're seeing in the Mazda case. It seems to me that a lot of car manufacturers have adopted a strategy of 
effectively not agreeing to a refund or replacement and pushing the consumer to taking legal action in a consumer tribunal. And from my understanding of these cases, the consumer, when they do go the distance to file hearing, are winning the vast majority of cases. Like almost every case has been won by the consumer. So I think this strategy that car manufacturers appear to have of pushing cases into the tribunal um, and, and hoping that a, a number of consumers give up along the way or are not willing to take that next step, that strategy will probably come to an end as a result of this Mazda case. I'm sure the ACCC will take follow-up actions after the Mazda case if uh, other manufacturers are engaging in similar conduct to Mazda. The key factor here will be how much penalty will ACCC get out of Mazda uh, when that comes around to the penalty phase. But if it's a large penalty, I think most other manufacturers need to immediately change their practice of favouring repairs of vehicles that are clearly suffering from a major failure. So I think all the other manufacturers have to take note of this case, be proactive, wait, waiting until this master case is finally decided is not going to be adequate. Really, on the basis of the findings of the judge in this case, they need to be immediately changing their their policies and practice um, in dealing with these uh, issues. So that's all I had. If you have any questions about this particular presentation, please feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Bye bye.